travel from Washington, D.C. to Chicago, food pantries here, like much of the nation, are seeing unprecedented demand, plummeting donations, and a lack of volunteers because of the COVID-19 crisis. It's during these times of disaster, Earthrin works to raise awareness of global food insecurity, a lesson started by her parents in her hometown of Chicago. I grew up in a family where commitment to service was what my family, parents were all about. My mother was a social worker and I always say my dad was a community organizer before Barack Obama made it popular. And so having an awareness of those who had less and working to develop solutions for addressing the challenges that those populations were facing it was something that my parents did every day, that we as children were volunteers in all kinds of programs. And so getting up every day and working to make life better for those who have less is my passion. Earthrin is a visiting scholar at the Center on Food Security in the Environment at Stanford University in California. She's also a distinguished fellow at the nonprofit Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Earthrin served as executive director of the UN World Food Program from 2012 to 2017. Her work took her to some of the most food deprived places in the world. Looking into your eyes and I'm imagining what those eyes have seen because I was in uh, Somalia in, in the 90s and, and saw uh, mothers clutching their babies that were starving. And you saw in their eyes the, the look of fear. They didn't know what the future held for them. And also that, that considerable love. And I know that that's just one episode in my life. You probably have a litany of those stories. What's it been like? Um, and I imagine that's kind of the drive, that passion that you talked about. But what's it like? Because um, I found it tough to go to sleep after that. I mean, those, those images stay with you. Yeah. It's always tough. Whenever you see a child suffer, your humanity, no matter who you are, will, will rise to the occasion. And you will look at the child and say, what do we do to make a difference? But when you talk about what have I seen, I get, you talk about Somalia. Uh, I, I stood on the border in the Dadaab refugee camp as women were walking and they'd walked for days across southern Somalia to reach the refugee camp where there were food and water resources that, uh, that uh, could allow them to feed their children. And they walked with these children without those resources. And the children were literally skin and bones. And you see children who are obedient and docile. And they lack joy because all of their energy they're using to survive, to keep putting one foot in front of the other, to keep walking. And sometimes these mothers will walk for weeks. I saw the same thing at the border between South Sudan and Ethiopia. Uh, and, and that one was even more tragic. That situation was even more tragic where I stood in a refugee camp in Ethiopia and I was standing there with the Minister of Refugee Affairs for the government. And we heard this blood curdling scream. And we were standing outside of one of the Doctors Without Borders tents. And the physician came out and told us that the mother had just walked for a week and she'd been feeding these children. She had three children, the youngest of which was six months old. Uh, she'd been feeding them water lilies and giving them the water along the road as the only uh, sustenance uh, for this, this long walk from South Sudan into the refugee camp. And the youngest child, the six month old, had just passed away. And here's a mother who walked with her children, gave them what she could, but could not save them. And that pain, 
uh, it's un, it's indescribable. I mean, somebody who's been there and seen it, um, what you just painted, I mean, I can visually, I can, but it's so tough to convey that to people because unless you've been there and seen it with your own eyes, it's, it's, it's unimaginable. And that's a good thing that it's unimaginable because if, if what we need is for people to move beyond the, the child with flies on their eyes and children who are dying to the desire and the public will to support the solutions so those children no longer suffer in that manner. As long as we can imagine it, we say it's, it's almost as if it's okay. Globally, the regions that bear the biggest share of people struggling with hunger are Eastern Africa and Southern Asia. More than nine out of 10 malnourished, undernourished children worldwide live in these regions. It's uh, really interesting. You're going to be teaching a course, The Politics of Hunger, yes. and you're going to tackle some of the myths. What's the most common myth that kind of surrounds hunger as an issue, would you say? Sure. One of the first questions that I always get when I speak is, don't we grow enough food? Don't we grow more than enough food to feed the world? So why are people hungry? And uh, helping people understand that where the food is grown is not necessarily where people are hungry. In the United States, yes, we grow an abundance of food here. We export uh, commodities from the United States, Europe, parts of Asia now. But in Sub-Saharan Africa, we don't. And as a result, we have hunger. And in addition to the fact that the, where the food is grown is not necessarily where the people are hungry, even in places like Africa, the food waste challenge there is food that is lost between the field and the consumer. Logistics meaning the roads, refrigeration, storage. And as a result, 40% of the food that is harvested is lost. Ertherin says anti-poverty measures must go hand in hand with anti-hunger programs. It's already happening in some countries. Millet, sorghum, and maize are high in nutrition and relatively more resistant to flood and drought. In India, the government distributed these grains for farmers to grow on their land and pledged to pay premium prices for these crops. In China, agricultural reforms ensured most rural farmers had land to grow on, allowing them to be food self-sufficient. China's poverty reduction efforts have contributed to 70% of the worldwide poverty reduction since the 1980s. One of the things I've heard you say, which I think is fascinating and, and true, is that policies do make a difference and you point to China. Uh, so many people lifted out of poverty, so many people hungry that now have meals. So policies do make a difference, don't they? Yes, they do. Um, when I, you, would, you would often hear me use China as an example of a country that the world said would never feed itself, that it would always depend upon assistance from the global community. Because 50 years ago, China was WFP's largest food recipient. And that all evolved to the point where President Xi now says that he will eradicate poverty by the end of 2020. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but it, it did take commitment from government to developing the programs, investing in the activities that were necessary to ensure the agricultural system was one that could provide access to food, but also ensuring that people had, and, and who could not afford food, had access to food. And that made a difference in the evolution of China. And there are many other factors that are involved there. But the reality of it is it began with a commitment by leadership to ensure that they were self-sustained in food access. Conflict-driven hunger is getting worse, according to the United Nations. And Yemenis are facing the worst food security crisis of anywhere in the world. 
with four-fifths of Yemen's population needing some form of aid or protection. The UN says it's one of the largest man-made famines in history. I think of uh, Yemen and, uh, and, and Syria. One day they're in the news, the next day they're not. But the crisis is still there. Yes. The fighting is still there. The yes. people are still suffering. Uh, how tough is that? Oh, that's, people would say to me often, well, the Syrian war has been going on for, what, nine years now, almost 10? Um, it, it, it's no longer an emergency. You need to reduce the number of people that you are assisting because um, it is no longer an acute emergency. But the notion that I worked very diligently to, to support was what we would call a protracted emergency is how you should describe a conflict. Because unlike a hurricane that hits, people lose their livelihoods, they need assistance, then they stable off and they rebuild and they go back to work and they build their lives. In a conflict, the acute situation occurs when the conflict begins and the bombs begin to fall. But when the conflict goes on and continues to move and continues to create the kind of uncertainty and fear in a population that limits the ability to move back into the workplace and move back into the fields to, to grow your crops, to go to the market. And, and as a result, the family requires ongoing assistance. That's what's happening in Yemen, that's what's happening in South Sudan, that's what's happening in Northeast Nigeria, in Madaguri, that's what's happening in all over Syria, but no one, no one reports on it doesn't make the media, it's not in the headlines. And so donor funds continue too often uh, are, are reduced. And as, but there's the number of people are still hungry. Talk to me about uh, the complexities and difficulties of the WFP. Uh, just from the sense, uh, funding's always an issue, you can never have enough. Um, and then one of the other things that I've heard you talk about as well is, is uh, I don't want to use the word sexy, but, but suddenly something ends up in the news and it's the flashpoint and everyone's interested in that. The people suffering in Haiti, let's send money for that. And yet they're suffering all around the world and you have targeted funds going for something specific. When I imagine at times you just want to throw your arms up and say, listen, people, talk to me. There's all kinds of problems. I can give you a list, top 10. Yes, yes. People would ask me, what are the worst situations? I said, any child that's hungry any place in the world, any mother that can't feed her child any place in the world is a priority. And we should not choose one child over another, one family over another, one community over another, merely because one made the news and the other one didn't. And what was becoming exciting as I was leaving WFP and the new executive director has carried forward is working with governments to uh, access more discretionary funds that would give them the, give the organization the capacity to provide the funds where they were required and not necessarily based upon where the news was coming in. The effects of climate change are disproportionately affecting food insecure people. A 2018 UN report identified South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, regions that rely heavily on small scale farming as the highest risk for losing harvest in the coming decades as the planet warms. You extend that out further, climate change, which is obviously having impacts as we speak, but are gonna to continue to be a problem. How much more difficult does this job get? It, that depends. If we do, we, the global community, invest 
in the adaptation and mitigation strategies that are necessary to support building resilience in agriculture for vulnerable populations because the poorest people live on the most vulnerable climate marginal and climate vulnerable places around the world. If we invest in those areas to support the right seeds, the right tools, the right access to communications that allows those smallholder farmers to continue to pursue their livelihoods, whether the, the weather is erratic or not, then we, don't, we won't need to provide the humanitarian responses that are necessary. Are there new solutions out there for these old problems? I mean, do you look at technology and say, okay, there, there are some things out there that can help us? Uh, are, are you looking at the landscape today and saying, yes. okay, I see the future is actually somewhat promising? And yes and no. <laughs> None of these answers are simple. I'm sorry. It sounds as if everything I say, I say, well, maybe. Um, there are new ag tech, food tech innovations that are coming online that uh, include everything from new irrigation systems to new types of seeds, new plant protections, new types of, um, of sensor devices, whether we're talking um, data-based um, sensors that support the plantings in and, and precision agriculture in a manner that will support the, the continued livelihoods of families during times of crisis of, of, of uh, climate impact. But the problem is most of the new tools that are coming online are coming online for the affluent, the farmers that can afford them. Because the climate, the impacts of climate are going to affect farmers here in the United States and Europe, just as it affects farmers in the developing world. Now, I, I will give a plug to, to Bayer, Bayer. I sit on, I, I work with them in, in Germany and they've made a commitment to providing seeds and support service for 100 million smallholder farmers. We need every company. We need companies around the world making those kinds of commitments. What little can all of us do to make a difference? Well, first of all, I tell everybody, vote. It is an imperative that people elect politicians that, because we talked about the importance of policy, who people elect politicians, leaders, that recognize the importance of the investments in agriculture and food systems that will ensure food security for all. Our stability as a nation, our stability as a global community is directly related to the decisions that our leaders will make, the investments that private sector will make, so if you're a shareholder, ask your company, what's their sustainability policy? What are they doing to ensure access to opportunity for those who live in places many of us will never visit? If you're a student, read more, learn more, because you're our leaders in the future. And having the capacity to understand not just the challenges that you face, but the challenges that others face. It's quite critical to recognizing that the solutions then that we develop must bring all of us forward. Very positive statement. Ask more, read more, vote more. They're, you're not even asking for money. So I'm not even you... asking for money today. Not today. <laughs> Give me another chance. Bring me back again. I'm sure I'll ask for money. <laughs> what a delight. Thank you Thank so you. much. You're welcome.